In today's lesson, we will discuss some important properties of light. Light is a common phenomenon. But if I ask you, what is light? How many of you will be able to give me a satisfactory answer? Or answer that is satisfactory to you? What is light? Well, the present day understanding of light is that it is made up of particles called photons which have wavelength and frequency. Now, can particles have wavelength and frequencies? Well, that is where quantum physics comes in. Well, everything is actually dual in nature. You and me are particles but also behaves like waves. It becomes more apparent when you look at particles like photons. Well, the energy E of a photon is directly proportional to its frequency and it is given by the equation E equal to HF where H is a constant called Planck's constant and F is the frequency. Planck's constant has a value given by this, which is 4.136 times 10 to the negative 5 electron volt second. And uh, one electron volt, I, I think I talked to you about that in one of the early lessons. <clears throat> one electron volt is the energy acquired by an electron when it is accelerated by using a potential difference of one volt and it is equivalent to 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 joules, a very small amount of energy. Well, one of the most important properties of light is that light can reflect. Light can be reflected. Now, that's a common phenomenon all of us understand. Here I have produced a beam of light that is on the table and uh, I have light rays that make up these beams. I have about five light rays here. If I allow these light rays to fall on a plane mirror, you can see I have kept a plane mirror there, you can see how the light is reflected. Now, here, this is an incident ray which falls on the mirror and that is its reflected ray. So, an incident ray and a reflected ray. The property of reflection is an important property of light. So, the ray of light that strikes the reflecting surface is the incident ray, and the ray that leaves that surface is the reflected ray. If you now draw a perpendicular to the surface at the point of incidence, we call that the normal. The angle between the incident ray and the normal is the angle of incidence and the angle between the normal and the, and the reflected ray is the angle of reflection. Now, reflected light obeys the laws of reflection and the most important law is that the angle of incidence equal to the angle of reflection. Well, Images on a plane mirror, you know that when you look into a plane mirror, you see your image. Is that right? Well, everybody is familiar with that. Now, the image produced by a plane mirror is actually due to reflection of light. And one of the properties of light that they did not discuss is that light travels in straight lines. Now, at least that is the perception we have, and that creates a lot of illusion. Light is a very deceiving uh, phenomenon, actually. It can actually create a lot of illusions. Now, this diagram shows you how an image is formed. Now, you can see an object is kept in front of a plane mirror. An incident ray on the mirror gets reflected according to the law of reflection. Now, if you look from here, this ray will not appear to be coming from here. It will appear to be coming from somewhere behind the mirror. You know why? Because light travels in straight lines. 
So look at the illusion it creates. It gives you the illusion that this light ray is coming from there. Therefore, you see the image of this point A at the point E. Similarly, a ray st striking the mirror here gets reflected that way. And if you look from here, that ray will appear to be coming from there. That means, if you can construct the images of all points describing this object. That will give rise to the image. And now, some of the characteristics of the image, the image produced is upright. This is the object, the image is upright. Now, the image is the same size as that of the object. That requires no explanation. And uh, the image distance, the distance of the image from the mirror, we call it d sub i, is the same as the distance of the object from the mirror, that is do. So di equal to do, and these are some of the important properties of images. Now, another and important one is the image is a virtual image. It really doesn't exist there. It's an illusion created by this rectilinear propagation of light. Now, if I now look at my image, can I catch it? It's simply not there. It's an illusion. So, it's a virtual image because it is not, it is not formed by the actual intersection of the rays. If an image is formed by the actual intersection of reflected rays, then it can be caught on a screen. Then it is a real image. This is not a real image. How about curved mirrors? Have you seen curved mirrors, mirrors that are curved? Well, they are very common around. If you go sometimes in a hotel, they have a curved mirror which will make it easy for you to shave. It will make it bigger. Your face will look bigger. Now, the laws of reflection are also obeyed on curved mirror. Depending on the curvature of the reflecting surface, there are two types of mirrors. Now, one type of mirror is a concave mirror, and the other is a convex mirror. Now, if you notice a concave mirror, the reflecting surface is caved in. On the other hand, a convex mirror, the reflecting surface is caved out. So that's a concave mirror, and this is a convex mirror. Let's now talk about some of the important features of these curved mirrors. The center of curvature, you see, if you take a curved mirror, all right, if you take a basketball, and cut one part of it. That will be a curved mirror. In other words, a curved mirror can be considered to be part of a sphere. The center of such a sphere is actually called the center of curvature of the mirror. So, center of curvature is the center of that sphere of which the mirror is actually a part. Now, if you draw a line passing through the center of curvature and touching the mirror at its geometric center, that axis is called the principal axis. Now, the distance from the center of curvature to the center of the mirror is called the radius of curvature, and we're going to represent that by the uppercase R. Now, if you allow a set of parallel right light rays, after they hit the mirror, they will reflect, and the reflected rays will actually pass through a point on the principal axis. And that point is called the principal focus and we will represent that by the letter F. And if you measure the distance from the principal focus to the mirror, it is called the focal length of the mirror. A mirror is characterized by its focal length. You can see I am actually going fairly fast with this. 
They're very simple ideas. Now, the mirror formula. If an object is placed in front of a mirror at a distance u from the mirror, so u stands for the object distance, and if f is the focal length, lowercase f, an image will be formed at a distance v from the mirror. So you must get used to u is the object distance, the distance of the object from the mirror, v is the image distance, the distance of the image from the mirror, and f is its focal length, <laughs> then 1 over f equal to 1 over u plus 1 over v is the mirror formula. In other words, if you can measure u and v, you can calculate the focal length of the mirror. So depending on the position of the object, the image may, may be bigger, smaller, or the same size as that of the object. You can actually create different types of images on a curved mirror. Whereas in a plane mirror, you can only create one type of an image, which is a virtual image. For using a curved mirror, you can actually create different types of images. All right. If HO is the height of the object and HI is the height of the image, then the magnification produced by the mirror can be written as M equal to HI divided by HO, the height of the image divided by the height of the object. And that will be the same as V divided by U, the image distance divided by the object distance. Well, in the case of a plane mirror, this magnification is 1 because the size of the image and the size of the object are the same. But in plane, in curved mirrors, you can create different types of images. You can create bigger images than the object and smaller images than the object. In such a case, magnification is a relevant quantity. Let's see how we can locate images in curved mirrors. Images formed by curved mirrors can be located by choosing two appropriate light rays starting from one of the points on the object. And generally we use a point on the top of the object. Now, if you look here on the diagram, I have chosen an, a, a ray that is parallel to the principal axis. A ray parallel to the principal axis after reflection will go through the principal focus. Now, and if you choose a ray that is passing through the center of curvature, after reflection, that will go back because when the ray passes through the center of curvature, it will be incident on the mirror at right angles. Angle of incidence must be equal to the angle of reflection, means the light ray will be reflected right back. So, a ray that is passing through the center of curvature will be sent back the same way. And a ray that passes through the principal focus after reflection will go parallel to the principal axis. Any of these two uh, light rays will be enough to locate an image. So, the figure on the upper right shows how a real image of an object is formed when an object is placed at a distance farther than two times the focal length. Now, you can see the focal length and the radius of curvature are related so that, so that the radius of curvature is approximately twice the focal length. So if you place an object beyond the center of curvature, it will be placed at a distance more than twice the focal length. In such a case, the image formed will be very small, it will be inverted, and will be formed between the principal focus and the center of curvature on the mirror. The changing the object distance will change the nature of the image formed. I'm not going into the details of this uh, in many forms. 
Now, on the other hand, if you use a convex mirror, the image produced will be always virtual. Just look at the diagram and that is enough. Let's do a small problem. A Star Wars action figure 8 cm tall is placed 23 cm in front of a concave mirror with a focal length of 10 cm. Where is the image? Where is the image means what is the image distance? How tall is the image? All right. What are the characteristics of the image? All right. To give you some idea of how to solve problems in mirrors. So what are the given things? We are told that the focal length of the mirror is 10 cm, the height of the object is 8 cm, and the object is placed 23 cm from the, from the mirror. We got the object distance, we got the focal length, we can use the length, the mirror formula to calculate the image distance. 1 over f equal to 1 over u plus 1 over v. We can now calculate v. So, use the values. Focal length is 0.1 meter. Image distance is 0.23 meter. And therefore, v equal to 0.177 meter. Well, once you know v and you know u, you can calculate magnification. Magnification is V over U, and you know those values, that means magnification is 0.77. The size of the image is smaller than the object. And how do you calculate how big the object is? Magnification also equal to HI divided by HO, is that right? A height of the image divided by height of the object. So 0.77 is HI divided by HO, therefore you can calculate HI, that will be 0 0.06 meter or 6 centimeter. So the height of the object is 8 centimeter, height of the image is 6 centimeter, the image is diminished. Now in such a case, the image is a real image. The image is formed by the actual intersection of the light rays. All right, let's now talk about refraction of light. Refraction. Now, light travels in free space, we talked about this, with a speed of 3 times 10 to the 8 meter per second. In fact, all electromagnetic radiations travel with the same speed in vacuum. But if you allow light now to pass through any other medium, such as glass, water, or any transparent medium, its speed will reduce. Now, what happens when the speed is reduced? The reduction in speed is always associated with a change in the direction of propagation. You see, when, whenever there is a sudden change in the speed, if you are going on a bicycle on a beautiful road, and if all of a sudden you come to a very bad muddy road, your speed is suddenly is going to change. And that change in speed will actually create a deviation in your direction of motion. You will be deviated. Now, a sudden change in motion always produces a deviation in the direction of motion. And it is that phenomenon we call refraction of light. Now, the speed of light in a given material medium is related to a quantity called its refractive index. And we will represent that by the small letter n. Now, how do we define refractive index? Refractive index of a medium is defined as speed of light in vacuum, which is represented by C, divided by speed of light in that medium which is also the same as wavelength of the light in vacuum divided by wavelength in the medium. But it is this equation that we will use in solving problems. You must be familiar with that equation. The sudden change in the speed of light while passing from one medium into another results in a change in the direction of propagation 
and it is that phenomenon that we call refraction. So if I ask you what is the phenomenon of refraction, you should be able to tell me that refraction is the phenomenon of bending of light while passing from one medium into another due to a change in speed. And you can see the illustration here. Now, this is the incident ray, and this is the refracted ray, and the refracted ray is bent. <coughs> the figure on the left shows a ray of light traveling from a medium of refractive index N1 to a medium of refractive index N2, where N2 is greater than N1. We say this medium is a denser medium than the medium one. You can see when light travels from a less denser medium to a more denser medium, it bends towards the normal. You understand the concept of the normal, a perpendicular drawn at the point of incidence. You see, when light travels from air into glass, it bends towards the normal. On the other hand, if light travels from glass into air, it will bend away from the normal. Whenever light travels from a less denser medium to a denser medium, it will bend towards the normal. Its speed decreases. When light travels from a denser medium to a less denser medium, it bends away from the normal. Its speed increases. All right, we have talked about all that. So the refracted ray bends away from the normal in this case, so that the angle of incidence, I think those things are self-explanatory. Angle of incidence, the angle between the incident ray and the normal. Angle of refraction. You can see when light travels from a less denser medium to a denser medium, angle of refraction is less than the angle of incidence. When light travels from a denser medium to a less denser medium, angle of refraction is greater than the angle of incidence. Now, the angles of incidence and refraction and the refractive indices of the media are related like this. N1 divided by N2. N1 is the refractive index of the first medium. N2 is the refractive index of the second medium. Then N1 divided by N2 is sine theta 2 divided by sine theta 1. That's an important equation. It's actually called Snell's law. So refractive index of the first medium divided by refractive index of the second medium is equal to sine of angle of refraction divided by sine of angle of incidence. Let's now talk about total internal reflection. Total internal reflection occurs only when light travels from a denser medium into a less denser medium. For example, when light travels from water into air, or when light travels from glass into air, this can happen. Now, look at different rays of light traveling from glass into, or water into air. You can see, as light travels from water into air, it will bend away from the normal. The angle of refraction is greater than the angle of incidence. Now, you can imagine for a particular angle of incidence now since the angle of refraction is greater than the angle of incidence for a particular angle of incidence the angle of refraction will be 90 degrees now if now the angle of incidence if now the angle of refraction is greater than 90 degrees where will the reflected ray go or the refracted ray go. It cannot go into the less denser medium means it will be sent back to the denser medium. So the particular angle of incidence for which the angle of refraction is 90 degrees 
is called the critical angle. The critical angle. You see, for a particular angle of incidence, the the emerging ray will go along the surface. That means the angle angle of refraction will be 90 degrees and that particular angle of incidence is called the critical angle. If the angle of incidence now is greater than the critical angle, the light ray will not emerge. It will be reflected back into the denser medium. Well, and that is a very important and very interesting phenomenon. Now, this diagram shows light traveling from water into air. You can see a, a lot of light is passed from water into air and a part of it is reflected. As the angle of incidence is increased, you can see the angle of refraction is nearing 90 degrees there. That means all the, uh, you can see, that is the angle of, now this particular angle of incidence is called a critical angle. And if you increase the angle of incidence beyond that, all the light is reflected back. No light escape into the that lens, less denser medium. This phenomenon is what we call total internal reflection. Now here I have the illustration. This is the critical angle. The incident ray, the refracted ray, the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. So the angle of incidence in the denser medium for which the angle of refraction is 90 degrees is called the critical angle. When the angle of incidence in the denser medium is equal to the critical angle, then Snell's law can be written as, you know that N1 divided by N2 is sine of angle of refraction divided by sine of angle of incidence. When angle of refraction is 90 degrees, the angle of incidence is called the critical angle theta C. And therefore, sine theta c equal to n2 over n1 because sine 90 is 1. Now, here I have a, another illustration. I don't know whether it, it comes out well in the, in, in the movie. Well, here, this is a laser that goes from water to air. And here, the critical angle is greater than the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle and you can see how it is totally reflected. That's a beautiful picture. An example. What is the critical angle for light traveling from glass into water if the refractive index of glass is 1.5 and that of water is 1.3? Here we have a situation, light traveling from glass into water. Glass is the denser medium, water is the less denser medium. And simply we can use sine theta c equal to n2 over n1. n1 is the refractive index of the first medium, n2 is the refractive index of the second medium, here it is water. So we got refractive index of water divided by refractive index of glass will be sine of theta c. And that will give you theta C, the critical angle, is 62 degrees. Let's now look at dispersion of light. Dispersion of light. You see, you know that light consists of over 3,000 different wavelengths. Now, when each of these wavelengths undergoes the deviation, the angle of deviation or the angle of refraction will be slightly different for each wave. Now, that can create the different wavelength to dispersing or spreading apart. Well, the extent to which a light wave is bent by a material medium such as glass depends on the wavelength of the light wave. Now, that means if white light is allowed to pass through a prism, each wavelength will be bent slightly different from the other. A shorter wavelength to correspond to a greater frequency, a greater energy, and a photon of greater energy gets deflected more than 
one of lesser energy. You see, it's like that. If you travel very fast on a bicycle, and if your speed changes suddenly, you tend to deviate much more than if you were going slowly. That is why slow speed is safer. In the same way, a very, a very energetic photon gets deviated more than a less energetic photon. For example, a violet photon carries more energy than a red photon. So if you pass white light through a glass prism, what comes out is actually a dispersed form of all these wavelengths. So as a result, when a ray of white light enters a glass from air, violet color will bend more than red. The effect is more pronounced when a narrow beam of light is allowed to pass through a triangular glass prism. Now, that's a beautiful phenomenon. The emerging light will spread into its constituent colors as we... Now, in the last lesson, I showed you that Although we say this is red, that's a combination of several hundred wavelengths. Now, this phenomenon is what we call dispersion of light. Now, dispersion occurs because refractive index is different for different colors. Now, we talk about refractive index of a material. Actually, refractive index of glass have different values for different colors. Glass has a refractive index for red, it has a different refractive index for blue, a different refractive index for violet, because each of these colors will be bent in slightly different angles. All right. The refractive index for ordinary glass for blue light is 1.53. And for red light, it is 1.59, 1.51. Slightly, distinctly different. Well, now let's look at lenses. When light is incident on one face of a prism, it undergoes refraction twice while emerging from the other side. Now, how does that happen? The result is that the emerging light bends towards the base of the prism. Now, I think I can show that to you. Let me see if I have that demonstration. Now, here I have a triangular prism. This is the base of the prism. I have allowed the three light rays to go into the prism. They bend while entering the prism and bent again while coming out. You can see the three light rays coming, they all bend towards the base. You can also see the concept of dispersion here. All of them have actually spread into colors. Look at the beautiful colors there. So, a light ray while entering a prism undergoes refraction twice and bends towards the base. So, when a ray of light passes through a prism, the emerging light bends towards the base of the prism. By combining prisms suitably, so if I put two prisms, the base of uh, each prism facing each other, and I allow light to f go through the combination, light will bend towards the base of each. It means that will act as a converging system. So, this is the principle of working of a lens. If you watch here, now, these are actually lenses put so that the bases are facing. And if you allow a beam of light to fall on it, they will all converge to one point. And on the other hand, if you put the prisms the other way around, if the bases are facing the opposite direction, like these, then it will produce divergence. So by suitably combining prisms, you can produce converging lens or a diverging lens. All right. I place two prisms. The bases are facing each other. What do they do? They produce convergence. And if I reverse the prisms so that they're now, their bases are opposing, 
they produce divergence. Well, this is the basis on which lenses are constructed. Now, here I have a lens which is actually the prisms, the basis facing, and you can see what it does. It actually produces convergence, if you notice the light rays are all converged. Whereas, uh, if I use a concave, a diverging lens, it produces divergence. So this is a diverging lens and this is a converging lens. Now I want you to watch that convergence. The, the point where they meet is actually beyond the screen. Okay, let's go back to the... So we have two types of lenses. One is a converging lens and the other is a diverging lens. All right. One half of a convex lens, if you look at this convex lens, which is a converging lens, if you take one half of it, it can be considered to be part of a sphere. And the center of such a sphere is called the center of curvature of the lens. We traditionally mark it as 2F. 2F is the center of curvature. Now there are two centers of curvature. There is a center of curvature on the right side and a center of curvature on the left side. The geometric center of the lens is called the optic center. That's the optic center of the lens. The distance from the optic center to the center of curvature is called the radius of curvature of the lens. A line passing through the center of curvature and the optic center is the principal axis of the lens. All these are similar to the, the terms we defined in the mirror. Now, rays of light that are parallel to the principal axis, a ray that is parallel to the principal axis after refraction will pass through a point on the principal axis and we call that the principal focus. So this is a ray that is parallel to the principal axis. After refraction, it will pass through a point on the other side of the lens, on the principal axis, and that point is called the principal focus. The distance measured from the optic center to the principal focus is called the focal length of the lens. The lowercase f, the same we use for the mirror. So the focal length is the distance from the optic center to the principal focus. Now images formed by a convex lens. Again, in order to locate images, you can see we can take a ray that is parallel to the principal axis. After refraction, it will go through the principal focus. A ray that passes through the optic center will not deviate, it will go straight on. A ray that passes through the principal focus after refraction will go parallel to the principal axis. Any of these three rays, any two of these three rays will be enough to construct uh, the image. In the same way as we used for the, for the mirrors, if u is the object distance and v is the image distance, well, if u is the object distance and v is the image distance, then, and f is the focal length, then we have 1 over f equal to 1 over u plus 1 over v, which is the same as in the case of the mirrors. Now the magnification m produced by a lens is m equal to height of the image divided by height of the object which is again v over u. Well let's use that to solve a problem. A 4 centimeter tall light bulb is placed at a distance of 45.7 centimeter from a double convex lens having a focal length of 15.2 cm. Determine the image distance and the image size. 
Well, now picking the data we have, the size, the height of the object is 4 cm, object distance is 45.7 cm, focal length is 15.2 cm. We can use these two quantities to find the image distance using the lens formula. This time we call the formula the lens formula. And that will give you V equal to 22.8 centimeter. And once you have V and the value of U, we can calculate magnification. Magnification is V over U, and that will be 0.5. That means the image size is half of the object size. And of course, magnification is related to height of the image and height of the object. 0.5 is HI divided by HO. That gives you the height of the image is 2 cm. Now, lenses are used to correct vision in nearsighted and far-sighted people. Most of you, I'm sure, use lenses. For a nearsighted person, images of objects placed far from the eye are formed in front of the retina and so a diverging lens is used to create an initial divergence so that the final image will be formed on the retina. On the other hand, for a far-sighted person like me, I have a far-sightedness, but I don't wear glasses because I can see uh, at a distance, not near. Now, for a far-sighted person, images of near objects are formed behind the retina. And that's the reason why, when I want to read something without my glasses, I take it away. Now, to correct that, we use a converging lens so that the lens will produce an initial convergence. Alright, what's the meaning of power of a lens? Power of a lens is the reciprocal of the focal length and uh, focal length must be measured in meter and then the power will be measured in a unit called diopter. So the power of a converging lens of focal length 20 centimeter is 1 over 0.2 which is 5 diopter. Now all these things will be revisited in one of the labs that we will be doing. The power of a diverging lens of focal length negative 20 centimeter is negative 5 diopter. Now the power of a converging lens is positive. The power of a diverging lens is negative. We are now going to look at another important characteristic of light, interference of light. Now in the discussion on wave motion, we talked about how two waves meeting at a point can either produce a bigger wave or no wave at all. Now the question is, is light a form of wave? Now this has been a question of debate in the past. Some scientists say light is made up of particles like photons, but some others say light is a form of wave. Now, who do we believe? Well, we cannot believe anybody. We can only believe or trust evidence. So, can light undergo interference? Can a beam of light meeting with another beam of light sometimes produce no light or sometimes produce more light? Is that possible? Well, light consists of transverse oscillations of electric and magnetic fields. We talked about that in the last class. And at right angles to the direction of propagation. Now, just considering the oscillations of electric fields, these waves can be represented as E of T is E0 sine omega T. We found that in the last lesson. This is how the electric field varies with time. Another wave of the same frequency and wavelength of slightly different phase, how will you represent that? Another wave of the same amplitude frequency but slightly different in phase. We can write it as E prime T is E zero sine omega T plus delta where delta is that phase difference. 
Now, if these two oscillations fall at the same place, how do they interact and what will be the resultant wave? If these two waves meet at a point, what will be the resultant electric field? Electric field vector at that point. That will be E0 sine omega t plus E0 sine omega t plus delta. And if you use, we have actually used this in connection with uh, discussing wave motion. So, when you expand this, it will be 2E0 cos delta by 2 sine omega t plus delta. And I use this in red because this is the resultant amplitude of that vector. And the resultant amplitude will be 0 when half delta is pi by 2, which was cos pi by 2 is 0. And this resultant amplitude will be 2 epsilon naught when half delta is 0 or 2 pi. You see that? So the amplitude of the resultant wave is 2 E0 cos 1 half delta. When the phase difference delta is an integer multiple of 2 pi, what will be 1 half delta? The amplitude of the resultant wave will be maximum and namely 2 epsilon naught and the resultant intensity will be a maximum. Now, so the resultant amplitude is 2 epsilon naught cos, cos 1 half delta and as a result if the phase difference delta is an integer multiple of 2 pi then 1 half delta will be 0 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi and so on giving the absolute value of this to be 1 and the resultant amplitude will be 2 epsilon naught. On the other hand, if the... Now, such an interference is called a constructive interference. We have actually seen this earlier. On the other hand, if the delta is an odd integer multiple of pi, if delta is pi, then p cos pi by 2 is 0, cos 3 pi by 2 is 0, cos pi by uh, 5 pi by 2 is 0, the intensity will be 0 for all such delta values. Now, this is called a destructive interference. That means a beam of light can actually constructively or destructively interfere. Light falling on light can produce more light or no light. So, what do you think light is? Now, it was Thomas Young who demonstrated this effect first, which conclusively proved that light has a wave characteristic. So, does it mean that people who argue for the particle nature of light has to give up and say, well, we are wrong? Well, not so simple, but what we have uh, now seen is light has particle nature. Now, let's look at the double slit experiment Thomas Young did. Now, what Thomas Young did is he cut two narrow slits on a screen and allowed a monochromatic light, a light of one color, to pass through the two slits. And what he observed on screen is actually bright, dark, bright, dark fringes. Now, how is that possible? So, Young sent light from monochromatic source through two narrow slits and showed that interference patterns can be seen on a screen placed behind it. The interference pattern was a set of alternating bright and dark lines. The, the bright fringe in the middle is caused by light from the two sources traveling to the screen the same distance. In other words, there's no phase difference. That's called the zero order fringe. The dark fringes on either side of the zero order are caused by light from one slit traveling half a wavelength more 
than the light from the other. That means light from one slit meeting with light from the other will be out of phase there and producing a dark fringe. This is followed by the first order fringe. You see this zero order, the first order, the second order. This is where light from both slits are in phase, they travel the same distance. The first order fringes are produced when light from these two arrive in phase again. A dark fringe when they are out of phase and so on. Now, let me see if I can demonstrate that to you. I have uh, here a source of light and a number of slits cut on a dark uh, glass plate. And if you look at uh, one of these, can you see this as a double slit? Well, it is a double slit. There are two white openings. Now, I'm going to let light pass through these and uh, I'm going to keep it in front of the camera and see whether you can see the different orders of the fringes. All right? Now, watch the interference effect when I keep the double slit in front here. Well, I think I need to make a little adjustment. Give me a second. Watch this. This is a very good interference pattern produced, uh, you can see the zero order and the different other orders. All right. Now, that's a very good one too. I'm using different slits actually here. All right. Here I have a diagram of the arrangement I just showed you. This is the source of light, the light bulb, and uh, this is the double slit. The distance between the two slits is D. <coughs> Let's uh, do a little theoretical interpretation. For two slits separated by a distance D, the path to difference. Now, I don't think you can see the point where on the screen, the light from this slit and this slit meet. That means the path of difference is actually this distance. That is the path of difference. Now, remember our discussion on wave motion. If the path of difference is an integer multiple of a wavelength, then the waves will be meeting in phase. So if this path of difference is one lambda, two lambda, three lambda, and so on, these two lights will meet in phase, producing bigger light. On the other hand, if this path difference is an odd integer multiple of half a wavelength, half a wavelength, three halves of a wavelength, five halves of a wavelength, then the two waves will be meeting out of phase, that means there will be dark light and so on. So, bright fringes correspond to d sine theta equal to m lambda, where m is an integer, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. m equal to 0 correspond to the central maximum, that's, that's what's called the zero order. Now, dark fringes correspond to d sine theta is m plus 1 half times lambda, that is this is how we write an odd integer multiple of half a wavelength. m equal to 0, this will be half a wavelength. m equal to 1, it will be 3 over 2 lambda and so on. And whenever the, the, phase, the path to difference is an odd multiple of half a wavelength, you have the corresponding, the resultant wave will be 0. So here, m equal to zero correspond to do two dark fringes, one on each side of the central maximum. So here again is the picture. If theta is the angle, 
that correspond to the bright fringe. Suppose this is the central maximum. And this is the bright fringe corresponding to order M. M to order. It can be 1, 2, or 3, and so on. So if theta is the angle corresponding to the bright fringe of order M, then Y is the distance of that bright fringe from the center. L is the distance between the slit and the screen. Look at the geometry there. Then for small angles of theta, sine theta is the same as tan theta equal to Y over L. Now, this relation is true only when the angles are small. Now, d sine theta equal to m lambda. d sine theta is that phase difference. Remember the path difference there? When that path difference d sine theta equal to m lambda, that corresponds to a bright fringe. That means lambda equal to d sine theta over m. So, if you can identify a bright fringe which is at the mth order, and measure that distance y, you can actually calculate the wavelength. So lambda equal to d sine theta divided by m, where I'm going to replace sine theta by y over l. So lambda equal to dy divided by ml. So what does y stand for? y is the distance of the mth bright fringe. That is, it can be the second, third, fourth, whatever you choose. <coughs> From the center, L is the distance between the slits and the screen, and M is the order of the fringe, D is the distance between the two slits. You can calculate the wavelength of that light. In fact, uh, that is a very effective way of doing I'm sure um, if you go and uh, major in physics, you will be doing this experiment as a junior in the college. Let's do a small problem. Two coherent microwave sources that produce waves of wavelength 1.5 centimeter are in the XY plane. One is at 0, 15 centimeter, and the other is at 3 centimeter. 14 centimeter. If the sources at these points are in phase, find the phase difference of the waves from these sources at the origin. Well, the distance of the source at 0, 15 from the origin is d1 equal to 15 centimeter because this is placed at x equal to 0 y equal to 15, that means the distance of that from the origin is 15 centimeter. It needs no explanation. The distance of the source placed at x equal to 3, y equal to 14, what is the distance of that source from the origin? It will be square root of 3 squared plus 14 squared, that is 14.318 centimeter. So, one source is 15 centimeter from the origin, the other source is 14.318 from the origin. Now, what is the path to difference between these two waves? The path to difference will be 15 centimeter minus 14.318 centimeter, which is 0.682 centimeter. Well, since one wavelength is 1.5 centimeter, the path to difference of 1.5 centimeter is the same is the same as a phase difference of two pi radians. I hope you understand. We have discussed this in wave motion. A path to difference of one wavelength is the same as a phase difference of two pi. A path to difference of half a wavelength is the same as the phase difference of pi. And therefore, if, um, 
A path difference of one wavelength is the same as a phase difference of two pi radians. That means in this case, a path difference of 1.5 cm is the same as the phase difference of two pi radians. What will be the phase difference corresponding to a path difference of 0.682 cm? I can leave it for you. you, you will be able to do that. A path difference of 0.682 cm corresponds to a phase difference of 0.682 divided by 1.5 multiplied by 2 pi, that is 4.3 radian or 164 degrees. That is the phase difference between the sources at the origin. That means if you use this value of delta in the equation for, what's the equation for the resultant amplitude? 2 e 0 cos delta by 2. If you now use the value of delta there, you will be able to obtain the resultant amplitude at the origin. Another problem. Sodium light is incident on a diffraction grating. A diffraction grating is simply a glass plate with large number of lines. That means if you take any such, any two lines, they will act as double slit. The double slit experiment that we have now seen. It has 12,000 lines per centimeter. That means you can now calculate the distance between any two. Can you? 12,000 lines are drawn in a distance of one centimeter. At what angle will the two yellow lines of wavelength 589 nanometer and 589.59 nanometer be seen in the first order? In the first order means m equal to 1. A diffraction grating is a darkened rectangular glass piece with closely spaced lines cut into it so that each line act as an illuminator slit when monochromatic light is incident on it. This means that the distance between the lines, which is D, <coughs> is 1 over 1,000, uh, 1 over 12,000 centimeter in this case, because there are 12,000 lines in 1 centimeter. That gives you the value of D, the distance between the two nearest slits, is 8.33 times 10 to the negative 7 meter. So in this case, M equal to 1, the first order of the French. Lambda 1, the first wavelength is 589 nanometer, convert that to meter, and the second wavelength is 589 nanometer, Convert again that to meter. We have sine theta 1. That means the angle at which the first wavelength will be seen clearly. The first order. The first order constructive interference for the first wavelength lambda 1 will be at this angle theta 1 such that sine theta 1 is m lambda 1 over d and we have all these values and that gives you sine theta 1 is 0 0.70708 or theta 1 is 44.98 degrees. Similarly we can find sine theta 2 for the second wavelength <coughs> that will be m lambda 2 over d and that will be 0 0.70779 sine theta 2. And that gives you theta 2 is 45.05 degrees. So, in that order of the spectrum, the two colors, the two yellow lines, will be actually separated by a small angle, this theta 2 minus theta 1. Another example. Two narrow slits separated by 1.5 millimeter are illuminated by red light of wavelength 679 nanometer. Find the spacing of the fringes observed from a screen 3 meter away. <coughs> now what are these quantities given here? 
3 meter is the distance L, the distance between the slit and the screen. And uh, the wavelength of red light is 679 nanometer. D, the spacing of the slit is 1.5 millimeter. We need to find the spacing of the fringes. You remember, we, <coughs> we talked about the empty fringe at a distance Y. If you can measure that Y, and if you know the order M, then Y divided by M will be, will be what we want. Isn't it? Is that right? We want the spacing between the fringes. All right. We got D, that is 1.5 millimeter, write that in meter. Wavelength, write that in meter. Distance between the screen and the light source is 3 meter. And if you remember this equation, lambda equal to dy divided by ml, where y is the distance from the center of the screen to the mth bright fringe. <coughs> So, let's calculate that y. y equal to lambda ml over d. Now, the spacing of the fringe is y divided by m. Because m fringes are contained in a distance y. The spacing of the fringes, therefore, is y over m. From this equation, y over m is lambda l divided by d. And that will be 0 0.00136 meter or 1.36 millimeter. You can see bright fringes at intervals of 1.3 millimeter. All right. And the last property that we're going to discuss is polarization of light. Polarization of light. What is that? Now, light is a form of electromagnetic waves consisting of oscillating electric and magnetic field vectors at right angles to each other and at right angles to the direction of propagation. We saw that in the last class. All electromagnetic waves behave the same way. Now, you can actually represent it like this where these arrows are electric and magnetic field oscillations and they have oscillations in all planes in all directions although the vibrations are in multitude of directions like this these vibrations can be resolved into horizontal and vertical directions just the same way we resolve vectors into horizontal and vertical directions and therefore we can assume that light wave can be thought of as vibrations in the horizontal and vertical directions <coughs> like this. In other words, all these vibrations can be resolved into horizontal vibrations and vertical vibrations. So at the moment, our understanding, therefore, should be light consists of horizontal vibrations and vertical vibrations of electric and magnetic fields. We have talked about that in the last class. Polarized light has vibrations in only one plane. That means if you can cut off vibrations in the vertical plane, then only the horizontal vibrations will survive. That means that light will have only half the intensity of the original light. Now, vertically polarized light has vibrations only in the vertical plane. Now, you can see here, now, this has only horizontal vibrations and this has only vertical vibrations. Now, now, a horizontally polarized light has vibrations only in the horizontal direction. Similarly, vertically polarized light has vibrations only in the vertical direction. The most common method of polarization involves in the use of 
Polaroid filters. Now, most of you are familiar with it. The sunglasses that you're using is actually a Polaroid filter, which allows only vibrations in one plane to pass through it. It cuts off vibrations in the other plane. When unpolarized light is transmitted through a polarized filter, it emerges with one half of the intensity and with vibrations in a single plane. For example, this is the ordinary light that has vibrations in the horizontal and vertical directions. And this is the Polaroid filter which will allow only vertical vibrations to pass through. It will cut off the horizontal vibrations. That gives rise to the vertically polarized light. Now, unpolarized light can also undergo polarization when it undergoes reflection and refraction. Now, for example, when a beam of unpolarized light with vibrations in both vertical and horizontal planes fall on a reflecting surface, the reflected beam is actually polarized. Now, it doesn't happen in overall surfaces. It happens only in the case of non-metallic surfaces. Actual fact, reflected light, uh, light reflected off the surface of water is partially polarized. The extent to which polarization occurs is dependent upon the angle at which the light approaches the surface and also upon the material on which the light is incident. Polarization can also occur due to refraction. When light is refracted, the refracted beam is very often polarized. Again, the extent to which polarization occurs is dependent on the angle at which the light approaches the surface and also the nature of the 